In 2014, Rochester Cathedral had its most important manuscript, Textus Refensis, digitized. So now anyone, not just historians and scholars, can turn the pages of this hidden treasure. What we're going to do now is take a closer look at the manuscript from the perspective of the scribe, the person responsible for putting the words on the page. Let's start by examining the written surface. Textus Refensis is written on vellum, that is calf skin. Prepared vellum is semi-translucent, and sometimes it's possible to see the writing from one side of the folio showing through to the other side. This is also partly to do with the fact that over time the corrosive, gall-based ink that was used by scribes has eaten into the surface of the vellum. There are two sides to vellum, the hair side and the flesh side. The hair side is usually slightly darker and smoother, and traces of the animal's hair follicles can often be seen. Scars and insect bites can sometimes be seen too. You may also notice a few holes. These probably occurred during the preparation of the vellum, for when skin is stretched, weaknesses from bites and scars may give way to small holes, and over time, as the vellum ages, these can tear or become larger. Now let's look at some of the scribe's methods. Before a medieval monk took his quill to his vellum, he had to design the layout for the script. The scribe used a pointed implement, often a knife or a stylus, to prick out small holes in the vellum, using these to guide the ruling of margins and the horizontal lines for the script. The first scribe of Texas Refensus, working in the early 1120s, used hard point, a pointed implement of metal or bone, to do the ruling. This leaves a furrow one side of the folio and a ridge the other side. It's quite difficult to see. Certain folios that were added later at the end of the 12th century, written by other scribes, were ruled with lead point, the forerunner of the modern pencil, which is far easier to see. Let's move on to the handwriting in our manuscript. By far the majority of Texas Refensis was written by a single monk, though unfortunately we can't be sure who he was. The style of the script he used is now referred to as Proto-Gothic Book Script. This was a script which developed in areas under Norman rule, such as England. The good thing about this script is that it is relatively easy to read, well, with a little practice. When writing in Old English, as opposed to Latin, the scribe chose to use certain distinctive, older Anglo-Saxon letter forms, such as the letter G, with its flat top. In addition, he used the standard Anglo-Saxon abbreviation signs for the word that and the word and. Some Old English letters are not found in the Latin text, and so the scribe had to reproduce the letters thorn and eth both of which equate to the letters TH when pronounced. Then there is the letter WIN, which, though it may look nothing like it, actually corresponds to the letter W. This green letter is the capital form of the letter F. Because a number of folios were inserted into the manuscript after the original scribe had finished his work, we can actually see differences between the hands of the various scribes. One interesting example can be seen in the Latin document dealing with the maintenance of Rochester's bridge. The first half, the left side of the document, is a replacement folio, and we can see that the hand is heavier and quite different from the original hand that follows. Experts would still describe both as proto-Gothic book script, but clearly the individuality of each scribe is there to see. Now let's look at what we might call scribal peculiarities. On occasion, our scribe appears to have not anticipated the amount of words needed for a rubric, that's the red text of a heading. Here, the scribe has run out of space and has had to write part of the rubric vertically. Scribes, both the original and later scribes, often chose to mark out particular documents or sections of a document with symbols such as crosses, chiros, or a gallows mark. Later readers of the original work underlined certain passages or words, or even drew a pointing finger to draw attention to specific details. What happened if a scribe made a mistake? He could correct his mistakes by scraping off the ink with his knife, or if he needed to, he could insert letters or words above the relevant line. If there was the need to add a substantial amount of text, he could use a symbol in the main body of the text, and a corresponding one in a margin where he would write the missing material. Occasionally, certain documents in Texas Refensus needed updating. Lists of popes or archbishops, for example, would from time to time need new names adding. 
and in the case of the library catalogue, we can see on this page that a scribe has crossed out a number of titles. Perhaps they'd been listed in the wrong place. We hope this film has shown you that the digitization of Texas Refensis not only opens up this great medieval book to study and research, but it also allows us all to gain insight into the everyday working practices of the medieval monk scribe.